Hi, I'm Daniel Field and I'm the new Strickland Curator of Ornithology here at the University Museum of Zoology at Cambridge and I'm excited to give you a sneak peek behind the scenes at what the ornithology stores look like here. So the ornithology collections here at Cambridge are pretty extensive. They include about 30,000 study skins of birds, over a thousand taxidermied specimens, about a thousand uh, skeletons, and a number of other kinds of preparations as well, including, uh, including tens of thousands of eggs uh, and some fluid preserved specimens too. So what I want to show you is a bit of what the collection actually looks like. And obviously we can't get into too much detail in just a short visit, but we'll look at a few exciting specimens to get a sense of what a research collection like this is like. So there are a few specimens out already. These are out because the museum's conservator, Natalie Jones, has been doing a condition assessment of a lot of our taxonomy. So you can see some spectacular specimens that were recently on display in the museum that have been taken off display uh, either for conservation or for uh, condition assessment. And these include some incredible birds of paradise, some of the most iconic, beautiful birds in the world, as well as more familiar birds like the sparrowhawk and quite a few uh, British and New World birds uh, down there as well. Almost all of the material in this collection was collected in the 19th century. And as you can imagine, at the time, a global, uh, enormous ornithology collection was extremely important for the development of ornithology as a scientific discipline. So in the present day, we have about 11,000 living species of birds, and a considerable fraction of that diversity is represented in this collection, including representatives of all the major groups of living birds. So as we pass down in this direction through the collection, we can see what the majority of the ornithology holdings are like. So we have these compactor cases filled with museum specimens. We can open this one. These beautiful old museum drawers are part of the so-called Strickland collection. And so these are specimens accumulated by ornithologist here at Cambridge named Strickland uh, prior to about 1854. So the specimens we're looking at here are part of a group of mainly South American and Central American birds called Cotingas, some of which are extraordinarily beautiful, as you can see, um, including one of my favorite birds in the world, this incredibly vibrant spangled Cotinga from Amazonia. So the Strickland collection, Strickland's own specimens, are all in these old wooden drawers, but the remainder of the ornithology skin collection here is preserved in these metal compactor cabinets, preserved in a very similar way. And we can sort of stroll down to the other side of the collection down here and get a sense of how these specimens are preserved. So if you open up these old compactor cabinets, you can see what the majority of the skin collection look like, uh, looks like. So these are gannets and boobies, a group of birds called sulids, um, which are large-bodied marine birds, mostly found in tropical environments. But of course, here in the British Isles, we have the northern gannet, which is famous for diving for prey from many meters above the Earth's surface, <laughs> the water surface, and plunging down face first with considerable force. So it's an amazing way to make a living. And these boobies and gannets are therefore some of the most amazing seabirds in the world. If we look down in this direction, we've got quite a bit of Victorian era taxidermy. So the collection here has over a thousand uh, taxidermy specimens. If you're a British bird watcher, many of these birds will look very familiar to you. So the majority of what we have down here are pretty iconic British birds, red-breasted merganser, gray plover, shell duck, etc. But if we walk up the stairs here, we'll get to the remainder of the taxidermy holdings in the ornithology collection, some of which is really exotic and historically significant.
forgot to mention, the collection, of course, also has a considerable collection of bird nests. These specimens that are uh, here temporarily include this incredible cacique nest from uh, the Neotropics, this amazing pendulous nest. Uh, these relatives of uh, blackbirds, New World blackbirds, that is, build uh, these incredible pendulous nests, uh, oftentimes in very large colonies. Uh, all hanging out together and uh, basically dominating the landscape with these incredible uh, enormous nests. And these are nests in various states of construction uh, uh, created by a weaver bird uh, that lives in Asia called the Baya weaver. So as we go up the stairs you can get a sense of some of the uh, diversity in our taxidermy collections. Again, uh, some of these are very familiar uh, British birds. We've got things like waxwings and sparrowhawks um, mixed in with more uh, exotic taxa like several kiwis. And uh, here we've got some New World grouse and uh, New World quail, including the Bob White down here. So in this part of the collection, we have the majority of the taxidermy holdings. So once again, these specimens are out because uh, we're in the middle of the condition assessment. Uh, so these, of course, are uh, woodpeckers, including probably the coolest woodpecker there is. This is the Rhineck, which is the uh, sister group. The Rhinecks are the sister group to all other woodpeckers. They almost don't even look like woodpeckers at all. They're very distinctive birds. Um, here, getting its photo taken, we've got a beautiful oscillated turkey uh, from Guatemala and Mexico. And all of these cabinets here are filled with exotic taxidermy. And if we continue on through this door at the back of the hall, we come to the skeleton collection. So the museum has important holdings of bird skeletons from both the modern world and the ancient world. We've got several important fossil birds here in the collection as well. And I'm primarily a bird paleontologist, so these fossils are of considerable interest to me. But if we walk down in this direction, you can see some of the mounted skeletons that we have here, um, many of which have had their uh, head removed, uh, their, their, their skulls removed for safety. The skulls are, are preserved alongside the rest of the bodies, but here we've got some oversized birds, some ratites like this Rhea down here. This is a secretary bird, one of those iconic long-legged raptors from uh, the savannas of Africa. Here we have a crowned crane, also from Africa. This is a relatively small-bodied cassowary. We do get burlier than that. We've got a quite a few other really interesting large bodied uh, bird, mounted bird skeletons from around the world here. This is something called a kagu, a flightless bird endemic to the island of New Caledonia. Very interesting creature. Here we have the skull of a kiwi. And here you can see some of our fossil and subfossil material. So this is the leg of an extinct moa giant flightless birds that used to dominate the landscape in New Zealand. So the collection here has a huge amount of really significant moa material, as well as quite a lot of bones from animals like dodos uh, and other relatively recently extinct birds. So we'll take a closer look at some of the ornithology collections now. So one of the exciting things about working in such a historical museum collection is that a lot of the specimens that we have here in the stores are not just important for their ornithological insights, but they're also important in terms of their place in the history of ornithology as a science. So in this particular cabinet, we've got some real treasures going back to the 19th century and the real early days of studying evolutionary ornithology. And some of the specimens here are not just exciting because of what they are. Some of these specimens are exciting because of who collected them. So if we turn our attention to this egg, this egg comes from a kind of bird from South America called a tinamou. Tinamous are fascinating. They're flying relatives of ostriches that look a little bit like, like partridges. 
But this particular egg is so exciting because it was collected by Charles Darwin himself. Charles Darwin, of course, did his undergraduate studies here in Cambridge at Christ's College. So in this collection, we've got quite a number of specimens that Charles Darwin collected, and uh, this egg is a, a great example of that. In addition, we've got quite a number of these Galapagos finches from Darwin's Beagle voyage. And these finches are obviously important in terms of the history of evolutionary biology for stimulating a lot of Darwin's ideas about natural selection. But they've uh, remained a really important case study for studying evolution in real time. So through the 20th century, ornithologists like uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant from Princeton have done fundamental research showing that rates of evolutionary change in bill shape in these Galapagos finches has taken place very quickly, oftentimes in response to climatic changes that have influenced the availability of different food types. Of course, these uh, Galapagos finches are not true finches at all. They belong to a group of birds called the tanagers, and they have secondarily uh, acquired uh, finch-like characteristics. Now, in addition to these exciting historical specimens, this cabinet also houses some real rarities in that we're actually looking at some extinct birds in here. So this is the skeleton of the famous great auk, which was a penguin-like creature that lived in the North Atlantic and went extinct around the mid 19th century. So the great auk, of course, is not a penguin at all. It's a member of the auk family, which also includes much smaller birds like puffins and razorbills and guillemots. And in fact, the closest living relative of the great auk is the razorbill, which you can see, uh, for example, on the uh, cliffs of East Yorkshire. Now, the great auk is a fascinating bird because not only uh, was it behaviorally similar to a penguin in that it flies underwater with, uh, uh, by flapping its wings, and it also can't fly in air. But the external anatomy of a great auk also looked quite a lot like a penguin. So if we look down below, we can see a real treasure, which is one of the finest examples of a taxidermied great auk to survive in any museum collection anywhere in the world. And there's probably no better place to come to really understand what a great auk would have looked like when it was alive than right here at the University of Cambridge Museum of Zoology. So in my research group, we remain very interested in the great auk because those similarities with penguins that have evolved independently provide a really interesting case study for thinking about convergent evolution where you have relatively distantly related groups of organisms that have acquired similar characteristics independently from one another. So we continue to study specimens like this one, even though this particular great auk would have breathed its last breath over 150 years ago. So in this cabinet, we again have some treasures representing species that are no longer around. So a couple of Famous extinct, relatively recently extinct birds include the Carolina parakeet over here, as well as the passenger pigeon. These beautiful taxidermy examples of these species that were last seen alive over a hundred years ago. It's kind of incredible to think about the Carolina parakeet, which at one point was a relatively widespread bird across the Eastern United States. Um, obviously there are no native uh, parrots, members of the parrot family, uh, in the eastern United States these days, so it's a huge loss in terms of the phylogenetic diversity of birds that used to inhabit North America. The passenger pigeon, of course, is a very uh, dispiriting and tragic example of uh, human-driven extinction. This at one point was one of the most abundant bird species in the entire world. Uh, accounts suggest that it would have uh, uh, formed flocks of many millions, up to billions of individual birds, and somehow, over the course of only a few decades, due to habitat loss and overhunting, the passenger pigeon, which had been so abundant in the United States, was entirely wiped out. Now, we have examples of other relatively rare birds in this cabinet, too. 
some of which are extinct and some of which are highly endangered. And the collection here at the University Museum of Zoology is particularly strong in its representation of Hawaiian honeycreepers. So these are relatives of finches, many of which are specialized for feeding on flower nectar that are only found on different Hawaiian islands. And due to habitat loss and the introduction of pests and invasive species, many of these endemic Hawaiian honeycreepers are either extinct or on the verge of extinction. So some of the best places to actually come and learn about the biology of these organisms, unfortunately, are museum collections like this one. And we're very lucky here at the University Museum of Zoology to be able to study specimens like these. So we've had a look at some of the museum's amazing taxidermy, but of course there are lots of other different styles of specimen preparation that you can see here in the ornithology collections at the University Museum of Zoology. And one of those important styles of specimen preparation is being able to see the entire skeleton of a bird, and obviously much of the skeleton gets removed when skins and taxidermy mounts are being made. So these specimens are complete mounted skeletons, and they're very valuable for studying the osteology, the actual anatomy of the skeleton of different kinds of birds. And this kind of data is particularly useful for people like me, who often study fossil birds, in order to make comparisons in terms of understanding how skeletal anatomy varies between different major groups of living birds, and how the distinctive features in the skeletons of different groups of living birds first evolved by making comparisons between living birds and fossil specimens. So for anybody interested in evolution, there's no better place to come than behind the scenes at a zoology museum like this one, because you can really study organisms up close and try to understand interesting evolutionary transitions that have taken place throughout the history of life. So one example is trying to understand how one of the most distinctive groups of birds in the world, that is the hummingbirds, came to be. Of course, hummingbirds are famous for being tiny, they're famous for being brightly colored, and they're famous for being specialist feeders on flower nectar. But if we sequence the DNA of a hummingbird and try to understand what the closest living relative of a hummingbird is, we're actually quite surprised to learn that the closest living relative of hummingbirds happens to be the swifts. And swifts, of course, are not nearly as tiny in general. They are not specialist nectar feeders. Instead, they are specialist aerial insectivores. They catch flying insects on the wing. And in fact, some species of swifts hardly ever come down from the sky. They can spend 10 months of the year up in the air. So if the closing li uh, closest living relative of hummingbirds are the swifts, what did these animals look like early in their uh, evolutionary history? Well, that's a question we can answer by turning to the fossil record, where we see that the earliest fossil hummingbirds that we know of had skulls that weren't elongated like the skulls of a modern hummingbird, but instead were short, characterized by very broad bills for catching insects in the air, like the skulls of swifts. And of course, hummingbirds don't only eat flower nectar, they actually catch insects on the wing as well. That's where they get their protein from. So hummingbirds are very derived evolutionarily in terms of their morphology and their lifestyle, but they still retain some behavioral characteristics that link them with their closest living relatives, the swifts. If you look even more broadly, the next group of birds that's most closely related to the swifts and the hummingbirds includes animals like nightjars, cryptic, largely nocturnal uh, birds that are very often aerial insectivores as well. So it seems like hummingbirds that catch insects on the wing are really retaining an ancient evolutionary specialization within this group for aerial insectivory. So we're here in the skeleton collection, which of course is 
fundamentally important for studying the osteology of different kinds of birds. So I'm holding the skull of a large living species of pigeon, a kind of crested pigeon from Indonesia. And this is one of many different kinds of pigeons among the hundreds of different species of birds we have in this skeleton collection. So to get a bit of a sense of the diversity of pigeons that we have in here, you can uh, check out this drawer. Obviously there's a huge amount of variation in terms of shapes and sizes of these birds. And this collection also has very well represented one of the most famous pigeons to ever live on the planet. And that of course is the dodo, a giant flightless pigeon that lived on the island of Mauritius until sailors essentially ate it into oblivion in the 17th century. So to get a sense of how extensive the dodo holdings are here at the University Museum of Zoology, we'll open up this box where you can get a sense of the number of individual tibiotarsi. So these bones are essentially the tibia or the shin bone of various dodo specimens. And as you can see, there are quite a few in there. Um, and this is one of the things that makes this museum really special. It's one of the most extensive collections of dodos left anywhere on the planet. So I'm holding the skeleton of a penguin. This is the skeleton of a king penguin. And one of the things that makes penguins so distinctive is the anatomy of their skeleton. Because if you compare the skeleton of a penguin with the skeleton of pretty much any bird, you'll notice some very distinctive differences. And one of the most distinctive elements of a penguin skeleton is the wing. Whereas in most birds, you'll see very lightweight bones that are round in cross section. All of the bones of the wing of a penguin are dense, very solid bones because they don't need to be lightweight to fly in air. And as you can see, those bones are flattened into almost two dimensions. And so we have these very, very flat bones that are really transformed into flippers to help propel a penguin underwater where it essentially flies, just flies in a different fluid medium than most other birds do by flying underwater. The diversity of bird life around the world is not distributed equally between different taxonomic groups. So of the roughly 11,000 living species of birds, over 6,000 of those species belong to a single evolutionary group that we call the passerine birds. And those passerines are just exceptionally diverse in terms of their colors and their shapes and their lifestyles. So, this is one cabinet of very many full of passerine bird skins here in the University Museum of Zoology. For those people interested in studying the evolution and diversification of this fascinating group of birds, this is an amazing place to come. So to give you a sense of some of the diversity among the passerines here, we can open up this drawer, which is full of beautiful, brightly colored birds called minivets from Asia. They're a kind of cuckoo shrike that means anything to anyone. This drawer is full of equally but differently colored, uh, beautiful, uh, extraordinarily vibrant Asian birds. So these are called leaf birds. You can probably figure out where that name comes from. In yellow, we have the Ioras, and then we have different species of creepers um, over here on the left. In this drawer, we have some more leaf birds, beautiful, uh, uh, green color. The Latin name for the leaf birds are the chloropsiidae. So chlorops like a leaf, chlorophyll, very green. And then over here we've got a stunning group of birds also from Southeast Asia called the fairy bluebirds, the irenidae. Uh, these brightly colored ones are the males and the more somber pale blue ones, which are also very beautiful, are the females. Uh, my grandmother's name is Irena, so I particularly like that group of birds. Here we've got some much more subtly uh, dressed groups of passerines. So these are subossine birds from South America, mostly wood creepers and different kinds of oven birds. And then down below we've got various species of cuckoo shrikes, as well as this group of birds that may be familiar to uh, bird watchers in this part of the world. Um, the wax wings. 
And the next drawer down, we've got some more South American wood creepers. This is an incredibly diverse group of hundreds of species that have diversified in South and Central America. And here, we've got something different altogether. These are teeny tiny nectar feeding birds called flower peckers, really beautiful birds. In the middle, we've got birds called partilotes, which are only found in Australia. And then over on the right, we've got a few different species of drongos, which are an old world, tropical old world group of passerine birds, some of which are very aggressive. And so here are some more beautiful drongo specimens. These ones largely from uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia. Some more drongos here. You can see the incredibly elongated and exaggerated rackets on the tails of these drongos, which are really spectacular to see in flight. Some of the most impressive looking specialized feathers you'll ever see on a bird. Down below, we've got some of the most brilliantly plumaged, beautiful pastoring birds you could ever hope to see. These are estrilded finches, um, also known as waxbills, and these include some famous birds like these gorgeous, brightly colored Gouldian finches, as well as the parrot finches over here in green, as well as species that are known alternatively as munias and mannequins. If we open these, uh, this, this last drawer down here, we've got some of the most beautiful passerine birds in the world. This is a group of birds called the broadbills. So these are also sub ossine passerine birds found almost exclusively in the old world in Southeast Asia. There's a few species of broadbills in Africa. And weirdly enough, there is a very strange representative of the broadbill group that lives in Western South America too, called the Sapayoa. So it's a very interesting biogeographic story. Here you can see one of the most beautiful birds in the world, in my opinion. This is a species of broadbill called the green broadbill. And not much of a mystery there. It's both green and has a very broad bill. So the passerine birds, for anybody interested in the evolution of extremely diverse groups of organisms, are a fascinating group to study. And fortunately, in the last few years, we've made a lot of progress in terms of our understanding of how the major groups of passerine birds are related to one another, which means that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of studying how the different traits and the different plumage patterns of different groups of passerines have evolved. So we're back here in the Strickland collection at the University Museum of Zoology. So all of these bird specimens were collected prior to 1854. And in a different part of the collection, we were just talking about passerine birds, this incredibly diverse group of over 6,000 species. Well, within the passerine birds, the most diverse group of passerines is a group of birds called the tanagers. We have hundreds of different species of tanagers. And that group is not only fascinating because it's so diverse, it's also fascinating because some species of tanagers are incredibly beautifully colored. So let's take a look and open up this drawer where you can see some incredibly gaudy looking, brightly colored birds, including this gorgeous swallow tanager here and different species that we call honey creepers, like purple honey creeper and green honey creeper here. These are not closely related to the Hawaiian honey creepers that we previously looked at. And these brilliantly colored birds called dacnuses, which are small bodied uh, tropical tanagers as well. So tanagers are only found in South America and Central America. The furthest north any species of tanager gets is the Rio Grande Valley, touching uh, the southern border of Texas. Um, and those species are actually not brightly colored at all. Those are uh, uh, relatively uh, plain looking birds called uh, seed eaters. Now, some of these incredibly beautiful tropical tanagers just really take your breath away though. And these include one of my favorite ones, this bay headed tanager, which is just so brightly colored. We also have some larger bodied mountain tanagers here. Um, these mountain tanagers uh, come from relatively high altitudes uh, in the Andes Mountains in Western South America. We can open up one drawer uh, uh, 
uh, of more tanagers here. And in this drawer, we can actually see some groups that have been reclassified since Strickland's time. So if we look over here, we've got birds like the scarlet tanager, which North American bird watchers will know about, and the summer tanager. We now know, in fact, that these are not truly tanagers at all. They're closely related to tanagers, but it turns out these are actually more closely related to cardinals and their relatives. So that group has been moved from the tanager family to the cardinal fam uh, family. Some of these other tanagers from South America, though, are true tanagers. And other species, like this one here called the Spindalis from uh, the Great Antilles from the Caribbean, um, has also proven to not actually belong within the tanagers themselves, but instead is on its own evolutionary branch, uh, close to the tanagers, but not actually within the group itself. Tanagers are so diverse that, of course, not every tanager species is brightly colored. In fact, there are scores of uh, much more subtle looking tanager species, such as uh, these white rump tanagers from South America. And a great example of some tanagers that are not particularly brightly colored are Darwin's Galapagos finches, which, of course, were thought to be finches originally, but we now know are actually members of the tanager family. So in the last few decades, with the advent of large-scale DNA sequencing, as well as computational methods to analyze those large amounts of data, we've come up with a much clearer understanding of where many of these different groups fit onto the bird tree of life. And so the tanager family has expanded in some cases to absorb groups like the Darwin's finches, and it's contracted elsewhere uh, as we've lost groups like the scarlet tanager and the summer tanager to the cardinal family and the spindalis to its own family. So that's all for today. Thanks so much for joining me on this quick tour of the ornithology collections at the University Museum of Zoology. Once again, I'm Daniel Field. I'm a Strickland curator of ornithology here at the University Museum of Zoology, and I hope to see you in the galleries at the museum sometime soon. Thank you.